private practice, then back to the hospital, and then he has been professor later than me. That was really a pity for me to say, no, I cannot be a professor, as he is not. <laughs> okay, so he has a wonderful life, and uh, of course you know so many about Cothead de Bousset spine surgery. He uh, showed us beautiful things in uh, bone tumors, he was an expert, he's an expert in CP and many, many things, osteochondrodysplasia and so So you may ask him a lot of questions and he's still very active because he's a member of the French Academy. Not only surgeons, which could be obvious, but <laughs> doctors, medicine, I don't know how to say, which is very rare for a surgeon to reach this level. So I will let you with him feel free to discuss any type of topic. I'm sure everybody will appreciate it. And if some of you want to have some question of anesthesia in pediatry, I don't know if you wish, and Marie, Jean's uh, wife is here, and uh, she attends so many meetings with him, so enjoy. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Assessant. Thank you very much. much. Uh, you understand that the when the uh, last form asked me, do you want to uh, make a session uh, where you will be a mentor? When Pierre Lascombe asked me, uh, we, got, we, we want to do a session where you will be a mentor. <laughs> I didn't realize exactly, but just after thinking, I realized I became old. <laughs> and this is very important. I became old. So, finally, I accept. So, I am ready to answer your question, if you have questions. Well, thank you for accepting our invitation. After wonderful introduction of Professor Lascombe, I want to ask Professor Debussy, Please, please tell us, how did you choose to become a pediatric orthopedic surgeon? Oh, this is a story. This is the story because, you know, when I started my medical studies uh, in the center of France, uh, Clermont-Ferrand, uh, the first teacher that impressed me very much because it was at the just beginning after the initial PCB, that is the science study that you are doing before entering in medical school. I was uh, in the hospital, I went to the hospital before starting any, uh, any study in medicine, and it was a neurosurgeon. And immediately when I arrived, I was never uh, an ID of the medicine. Uh, he took me and he bring me with him in the operating room. Oh. It was terrible. <laughs> but after, of course, uh, I make the competition. I was in Paris because he sent me to Paris. He did not stay in Clermont-Ferrand. Go to Paris. Oh. So, I decide, I say, I want to become a, a neurosurgeon. And finally, yes, if I had a new life, I will concentrate my work on the nervous system. Because I think that the nervous system is the most important not only for intelligence and something like that, but for function. But finally, uh, during that time, I met uh, my future wife. And she knows that uh, I am very sensitive. And at that time, it was in 1950-something, Uh, we married 59. 
She says, we, your character, you cannot accept that one, one of, of the two patients will die at that time. One of two patients in no surgery will die. You will never, I cannot, I cannot uh, be married with somebody like you if you continue to want to become a no-sir. You have to choose because be between me and the no-sir. <laughs> <laughs> it is a reality. You can ask my wife. She is just in her room. <laughs> so I choose to become a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. Why? Because in my mind, it is very important to, to put a, a femoral head on a fracture of a femur on a elderly people like I am. But doing a pediatric uh, orthopedic surgery, if you help the patient, your goal is to help the patient up to all the life. And it is for me much more important. It is why I cannot accept something that happened in some places, even in the in the government, where there is so big uh, separation in between pediatric, adult, and elderly people. No. When you are an orthopedic surgeon, pediatric orthopedic surgeon, you have to think what will be your patient when he will become old. And it is very important to have that in the mind when you start to do pediatric orthopedics. You don't agree? All right. <laughs> yes. I'm sure that André agrees, of course. Alain, you, you are a completely into growing, but you Good. think always that the most important is what it will be when you become old. Well, thank you very much for that uh, excellent explanation. It was very, very nice. How did you get into the scoliosis um, uh, treatment, oh. and uh, how did you um, met Dr. Cottrell and uh, develop? Uh, could you oh, this a little is another bit, uh, story. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> this is another story, you know, this because uh, my mentor, I have a mentor. My mentor, uh, his name, you don't know. You don't know him. You don't know him because uh, it's, it was a man so, so kind. He was a surgeon, but he ate to take the knife. His name is Pierre Queneau. You have never heard about Pierre Queneau. Who knows Pierre Queneau in the room? <laughs> Unless my, my very close friend. <laughs> you don't know. And this man uh, was uh, a good friend of uh, Yves Cottrell. But he gave me the way to approach the patient. And uh, he was very interested in uh, in spine, of course, uh, because it was difficult. It was the surgeon that uh, crossed the ocean and met Risser and met the great uh, master uh, of uh, scoliosis at the time in uh, the United States. And he came back to France with all the new approach for that. And uh, uh, so, I met Yves Cottrell in a very special condition. Because at Saint Vincent de Paul, we had a, a great uh, number of uh, patients, and uh, especially congenital one. And uh, Yves Cottrell was doing a, a, a work in Berplage, 250 kilometers from Paris. He was doing uh, research on uh, trying to classify the various defects, uh, various abnormality in uh, congenital uh, spine deformity. And with Pierre Penot, they call, and so they decide that uh, every Saturday, 
I was going to Berplage with uh, 20, 25 charts, very heavy, because now all the images are here. But at that time, it wasn't a sharp, uh, three kilo by sharp, you know? By, uh, so I went to Berplage, and uh, during a long time, many, many, many times, uh, and perhaps, uh, I don't know, five, six months. And uh, we established a classification that is published uh, by uh, Yves Cotran. So I met him at, the, at that time. And after uh, I concentrated my, uh, my work uh, in uh, San Vincent de Paul by doing everything, he, 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 even at 3 years of the Sophagus, even earlier than the Alpha, uh, every, every kind of pediatric uh, uh, surgery, not uh, only orthopedics, because uh, the chief of the department, uh, another mentor, of course, uh, Pierre Petit, was a marvelous, mar marvelous person. He has a very, very strong school in saint vincent de paul not only on technique, but on moral, on plenty of things. So, uh, Yves Cotrel uh, developed many, many instrumentation before uh, he came back. He, he has developed uh, BDT to transverse system because he has modified Arrington instrumentation. At the beginning, he, he was using fidial graft in between two books. So he had made, a, in his mind, it was to reduce the, the time of uh, casting after, uh, after uh, surgery, after spinal surgery. Because uh, when I did uh, the first spine surgery in Saint Vincent de Paul, it was inside the, the cast with no instruments, with nothing. Only fusion and uh, casting inside the cast, and uh, long fusion, and always the Apollo. Uh, it was polio at that time, polio patient, most of them. And uh, he told me, uh, you know, it's necessary to have good fusion. And to have good fusion, you must use tibial graft. And I start to use tibial graft at, as early as I was doing, uh, early beginning, before the Wellington instrumentation. And one day he told me, you know, we have to go to Lyon because uh, uh, or, 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 uh, Claude Regis Michel has been to the United States and came back with the Arrigan Road in, in France. And Keno, uh, Pierre Keno asked me, we have to go to Lyon to see how it is difficult to use this instrument. We went there, and I discovered it was not difficult, because I had already started to do uh, the facet joint uh, uh, fusion at the thoracolumbar junction of the, of the of, of the spine, without uh, nobody has shown me, because at that time the facet joint fusion was not done. It was only posterior uh, avulsion of the lamina and uh, nothing on the on the joints. But I have looked and I have uh, read that it was good to have uh, some fusion. So I start slowly and slowly. Uh, only at the thoracolumbar junction. And because I was working with Madame Duval Beaupère, she said, oh, you know, your fusion are very strong. And uh, you have no pseudarthrosis. Some of your colleagues have pseudarthrosis. So after that, uh, uh, we start to use regularly uh, Arrington instrumentation. Then during that time, Yves Cottrell did the transverse, the DDT, and uh, uh, we, we don't met uh, until he came back 
long time ago, Bec a long time after that, because he had some problem uh, with the heart and everything. And uh, uh, he came one day in December 82, uh, 80, 82, 82, December 82, uh, with uh, the neural rod, with uh, two types of hooks, closed and open, and uh, DDT, of course. And uh, he, he said, uh, you know, <coughs> perhaps we can do something with this instrumentation that will be of the shape of uh, of a scale with two rods and two DDT to have a square construct. And uh, I, I say, why, why not? We, we, we can do that. But I, I told him, why you come to see me again? He, he said, because I have phoned to Pierre Collot and uh, perhaps uh, uh, Jean Dubousset will help you, he said to, to Yves Cotteret. So uh, I say okay. And uh, we start to modify, improve uh, the, the CD instrumentation. This, this yes. is the story with yes. uh, Yves Cotteret. And after we went very, very close friend, of course, but it was started a long time not before. Exactly. Long time before. You have done tremendous contributions to the uh, orthopedic surgeries involvement, and if you consider th them, which one do you recall having had the most impact on yourself personally? On what? Uh, having the most impact on you yourself, uh, for considering for the contributions that you have done for orthopedic surgery. Oh. For me, it's a, a small drawing, very simple drawing that is now something very important. For me, the major contribution I did is the conus of economy. What do you think it is with this one? You think too? You think it? Andre? Where we saw that, no? And you? <laughs> What do you think? Uh, this is, I, I think, for me, is, is the best. Of course, the three dimension, of course, the three dimension, because when I spoke about the three dimension, it was uh, uh, in, uh, in, say, in, in 73, first mm -hmm. yes. Three dimension, nobody speak about three dimension at that time. So three dimension, but three dimension is evident. Evident. Even if now, until now, nobody understands the horizontal plane. <laughs> nobody understands the horizontal plane. Or scoliosis is an horizontal plane deformity. It's not a P, sagittal, it is horizontal. Because if there, if there is no horizontal plane deformity, you will not have scoliosis. So my important contribution, but I think is called economy. You know why? Because this is when the pediatrics goes to the adulthood. And now you will see that uh, the most important problem for elderly people, it is balance, alignment, balance, and it is called of economy. When you are in the cone of economy, you don't need any instruments. You don't need any instrument because the forces put the, the fusion in a good position. No, this is balance. But balance is neurology. So if balance is neurology, it is why if I have a second life, I will do neurology. Well, <laughs> you have understood everything. Ask you a question. Well, thank you very much for that answer. Um, We'll just maybe ask one more or two more questions and maybe let the audience also answer some questions. Um, 
my question would be also is like um, we have a lot of young colleagues sitting here in the right. audience, right? Yeah. So what would be like um, for you like recommendations to the younger uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon based on your knowledge and your career? Um, what would you recommend us? Each one of you are researcher. In our country, university has decided to, the, to give to the people uh, obligation if they want to become a university man to do one year, or I don't know how many because administration and me are not uh, very, uh, one year of research. But research is the basis of our work. We must have always thinking research. Why? Because research helps you to understand the reason of the disease. And until you don't know the reason of the disease, you navigate like that. When you know very well the reason of the disease, then you can focus on a proper treatment. So I think it is the most important thing. The most important thing is not the technique. Everybody we, we, will, uh, will learn the technique. Some people will learn the technique in one day, others in one month, others in one year, but everybody will learn the technique. Much more important is the strategy. Strategy much more important than the technique. This is my opinion for the youngs. And uh, I've always in their mind some place for research. And one of my teachers, Robert Meary, told me when I was resident, you have to choose one, one topic, but in this topic, you must be the first in the world. <laughs> it may be the little figure, but this is advice. Well, thank you. Um, I'm sure a lot of questions are rising up in your heads. Uh, maybe we can take some questions from the audience? Of course. Who has a question for uh, Professor Dubousset? can be anything, right? Just uh, I'll take advantage of this moment. Well, for example, you, in the middle of the, of the room. You, I look for you. <laughs> Ask me a question. You. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't know you, but you have to ask me a question. It's a question you want. The question I was going to ask has just been asked, actually. I'm just about to start independent practice as a consultant, or maybe in a few months' time, and it was if you had any advice for someone who was just about to do that. But I think you've, if you have any more advice, because I think you just gave us one uh, very good piece of advice, which was to have a, a long-term goal or strategy. Do you have any other advice for someone who's just about to start out in independent practice? For, for what? Uh, for someone who's about to start out in independent practice as a consultant. As a consultant? Independent. So, to move from training to um, <coughs> practicing on your own. To move on Ah, yes, 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 I understood. I understood. Uh, yeah. But this independence, this independence must be acquired during your, the end of your studies. If you are with a chief or with a, uh, that will understand that it is important to pass the ball. You understand know what I mean? Like in rugby. So if uh, uh, the chief, uh, the senior, or uh, the resident working with you, uh, give you the opportunity to start to do part of the surgery, the other part, this will be great. So when you arrive, you will, st you will be independent. And uh, it is why uh, I start uh, in private practice, uh, outside, because of many problems, uh, I cannot explain everything, but uh, uh, I had to start in, uh, in private practice in Paris. And 
because I have trained properly before, uh, Pierre Queneau ate the knife. So he gave me, you do it, do it, do it. <laughs> cut here, cut here, okay, that's that, that. yes. And I developed the anterior surgery, but I've never seen one of my colleagues doing anterior surgery of the spine, but I opened the small book of Oxon, the, the, the little book, uh, green book of Oxon, where anterior TB, uh, the spine was explained, and I start alone to do anterior surgery. So, you, if you are prepared properly by your mentors in the hospital, you will go. I was the only one in Paris doing uh, uh, scoliosis in private practice. <coughs> so it is uh, the way. If you are prepared, you have to go and to be confident. And to be confident, it's not difficult. To be confident, you must prepare in your head the day the night before the surgery, everything you will do, everything you repeat in your in your head. When I start the, the, the big tumor surgery of the pelvis, uh, I repeat many many times. Oh, at that time, at the, you will find this. But the problem is strategy. When you know strategy, is finished. Very rarely during surgery you will have facing uh, something that you have not thought before. So this is quite okay. Can you tell us uh, a bit of your uh, philosophy in the, with the tumor surgery? What philosophy? Your, your philosophy. My philosophy? Of the tumor surgery. Oh, the philosophy is first to do a proper diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> when the proper diagnosis is done, if it is a, a, a tumor uh, benign, you can do it yourself if you know everything about uh, uh, the way to treat uh, nervous malbonsis or other things. Uh, uh, but to, to be sure of the diagnosis, the first thing is to be very hand by hand with uh, uh, the pathologist. You cannot imagine how I learned in, in, uh, in, uh, in Gustave Roussy and before uh, in uh, Cochin before with a pathologist. I have plenty of pathologists in front of me. They taught me what, what is a tumor. And when it is a diagnosis malignant tumor, you must work with the complete team. You cannot approach a malignant tumor by yourself alone if you are even a great orthopedic surgeon. It is a team that will, uh, my philosophy is that. And when you have planned the treatment, no problem. Not all the patients are cured, unfortunately. But the main philosophy, when you are with a young, a young adolescent with a malignant tumor or osteosarcoma, the child and the parents and the child must go to the war to win, not to lose. So it is so important, the relationship in between the surgeon and the parents, not only for tumor, but for everything. This relationship is unique. And if you are completely confident with them, if they know everything, you will uh, realize uh, great things in tumor surgery, in any kind of surgery. 
And it is a pity that the relationship diminishes a little bit because of that, because of the screen of the computer. Speak with the patient. Speak with the with the, with the Don't hesitate to say it may be difficult. You know when 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 I did the first Elizabeth of the spine and when I was in the United States, I have never done before. And the the, the, the mother of the patient asked me, Did you have you done that before? It was in the United States. I said, no, I never did, but for your patient, I think it will be good. <laughs> and she answered me, okay. And the surgeon, it was Harry Schoffelberger at that time in Miami, he, he, he told me, the mother tell you, go ahead. And we lengthened the spine 11 centimeters. And the, the, the small child that was uh, uh, out of breath with a vital capacity 27 cc, uh, when he was there, uh, it was uh, 57. So don't hesitate. Explain everything. It may have complications, but we will not have complications if there is some complication. Okay. Professor Debussy. Voila. How do you see the uh, evolvement of the treatment for scoliosis and what are your you know, thoughts about the future of scoliosis? Oh, this is easy also, because my philosophy is clear. Spinal fusion is uh, uh, the defeat. It's a defeat. It's not the goal. The goal is not to fuse. The goal from time to time, you have to fuse them separately. The goal for idiopathic scoliosis is not to wait. Is not to wait uh, uh, until 30 degrees to start the uh, street, until 25 degrees. No. The, the future for the treatment of scoliosis is genetic research, everything, I agree, but. Uh, the future for me is to make detection, detection very early, 15 degrees, if we speak about degree, but rotation, real structural, and to detect the sign that with such patient uh, and such deformity will be progressive or not progressive, because many of them are not progressive, but many, many are progressive. If we can detect at that uh, time, very early, whatever age, but very early, it will be the progressing one. We must treat the progressive immediately and not wait another six months. Because during that time, six months, you see, you have in your mind your small vertebra. Your small vertebra surrounded by the cartilage that are squeezing, turning. Uh, and the, the structuralization increases. And to go back, very difficult, unless you fuse. But if you are able at that time to change, to detorque the spine with proper brace, proper exercise, proper thing, uh, yes, you will finish without any fusion. So this is important, the future is Detection prevention. It's like CDH, exactly the same thing. No difference. Pediatric orthopedics, everything is the same. Basic. As soon you can detect that it will progress, as soon you have to treat. This is the future. Of course, uh, we will uh, always have uh, indication for surgery. <laughs> I am not. Uh, <laughs> Embarrassed for the future of the orthopedic, pediatric orthopedic surgeon, there are plenty of work to do, <laughs> no, no problem. But uh, for idiopathic sclerosis, the goal is to detect the reason, one day perhaps prevention, but uh, uh, taking the diagnostic early makes the prognosis of, of, prog of uh, progression early and treat immediately. Voilà, this is the future for me, for idiomatic scoliosis. 
for the treatment is uh, you have heard all the discussion screw everywhere why I don't know I don't know for the company it's good <laughs> for the patient from time to time when it is adults with descending scoliosis because the, the initiation is a disc disease for the adult but for uh, the child growing and structuralization, I don't know what, uh, what uh, give uh, more uh, screw everywhere. Really, I don't know. Some place, yes. Some place, no. And uh, it's better to not be addicted by the cobagger, which is some, something that I say everywhere. I am not addicted by the cobagger. I don't look so more than the gobangal. The gobangal show you only the collapsing of the spine. Torsion, yes. When you do a cast for correction, everybody look, uh, you 30 degree, ah, you put this 30 degree to, down to 25, ah, it's good. This is not the goal. The goal is to the top. And you repeat the cast. And this is my philosophy. All my pupils know that for perfect. If nobody asked, um, yeah, I was wondering if there's any more questions. Nobody. Any more questions? Yeah. Hey, oh. Um. Yes. Uh, uh, ah, good. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you this. You talked about how you found your mentor. I wanted to know what characteristics you <laughs> we should normally look for if we're looking for mentors for ourselves. How do you know what? What what to look for in in uh, senior surgeons to look for a mentor for ourselves. For a mentor? Because they can answer the question. They can answer the question. For they choose their mentor. Ah, that's a good mentor. You want to choose a mentor? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is your question. Yeah. Ah, your question. So, is this not difficult? No, nothing is difficult. It is not 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 difficult. When uh, you you are in uh, in the course of your uh, of your education, if somebody of you you are uh, working with you, or uh, uh, if he works uh, out of you, uh, you can go to to visit him, to speak with him, and uh, to have some relation. If you feel from you, if you feel this one is good one, you, you go in to see him and to uh, speak him. Always communicate is only a question of communication and transmission. Okay. But you, you, you will find, of course, a mentor. There are plenty of mentors everywhere. Everywhere. I think you, Jean, you must explain to the younger colleague your controversial relationship with statistics oh. and standard deviation. Oh. Because that's something everybody should know your position about that. Ah, yeah. Well, this is easy. For me, Statistics uh, means nothing. <laughs> no, 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 uh, no, I don't. Evidence-based medicine. What is evidence-based medicine? How you can do evidence-based medicine for surgical, for surgical uh, act? Have you done two times, only two times, the exactly same surgery? Nobody can answer yes. Why? Because I have never seen in my life two patients strictly the same. So you change something. In the uh, lengthening of the ill cord, you cut a little bit more, a little bit less. Oh, you know exactly what you do. And you will put it after statistics. 
when I start my, uh, because I, I introduce perhaps somebody of no, I introduce the limb salvage in my in my country about the in children, and I was working a big department of uh, of uh, cancerology of cancer Institute Gustave Roussy, when complete floor its statistics. So they sent me after the 21st osteosarcoma I did, they sent me a big chart like that to be filled. I feel very conscientiously. Uh, but fortunately, at the end, it was a, a, a case, a, a place uh, to, to do other cases. Alors, on the 20, they sent me, 19 were other cases. Because in the description of the surgery, it was not the same. So, so they said, OK. We will never send you more chart to be filled because uh, you are not for statistics. <laughs> of course, it was. Je ne pouvais pas. It was not possible for me to 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 say no because all the the, the demand, all the, the the question was not covering the the, the surgical act completely. It's really quasi impossible to. So, no, statistic is not good. Evidence-based medicine is based like on that. I cannot uh, accept. Evidence-based medicine is uh, your experience. And my experience uh, is not yours and will never be yours because uh, experience is not transmissible. Only you can get experience. You can get some advice. Some of my pupil call me sometimes to give me an advice, an advice. but uh, experience is yours, is not uh, only yours. Voilà. Any more questions from the audience? Um, you know that experience comes by the way we learn from our mistakes. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you remember when you made one of your biggest mistakes in yes, your life, I and, I don't, and I don't mean technical mistakes, but more in your relationship with Absolutely. patients and with the family. You know, you, learn from. you know, you know, you, you know, you are reading on my brain. <laughs> Absolutely. And, it is, and your question is very important. Very important. You know why? My biggest mistake was one day when I got a, a mother who is a child, CP patient, severe CP patient. And uh, when uh, I, during the discussion, I said, your child will never walk. This will be my biggest mistake I did. Because you understand this mother, <sighs> Collapse. Collapse. So I understand at that moment that no, even if he has no chance to walk, you must, you must, you must uh, uh, say, you must uh, say to to this uh, mother, we will do maximum, and slowly and slowly with years, will, she will understand. And, so this one, my biggest mistake. Thank you. Any more questions? Professor Debesse, two years ago I met you, or maybe three years ago, and you delivered a fantastic lecture on arterial forces multiplex congenita. The, uh, on, the, on the outcome after adolescence in the adult age group, I remember very vividly what you delivered in this lecture. I was so impressed that uh, at your age, I'm sorry to say, at your age, but you have, you have so much of interest in research, uh, interest about what is happening to your patients after 25 years after you've operated them. Are you still engaged in this research work? For, 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 of course, sir. 
it's, it's absolutely necessary to, to, to know what was happening to the patient afterward. The interest of our work in, in children is to know what they will become uh, 25 years, 55 years, uh, of course. I have, I, I have patients that call me, call me two, 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 two or three times a week. They are very old and, and, and they ask me some advice because they have another trouble. So it is so important to, I don't remember this, uh, this, uh, this talk that I gave. Uh, it was uh, for the future, for the, the, the late result, you say. Huh? Yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. it is very important. I think it was three years ago or two years, I'm not very sure. But yeah. it, is, it, is, it, is, it is so important. It is that I try to explain you that uh, when you choose to do pediatric orthopedics, it's not for the end of growth, it is for the end of life. But of course, uh, end of growth uh, gives you a, a, a rather good idea <laughs> that will be become uh, for the future. Professor Debussy? Yes? You have said already more than once that you would choose probably to do neurosurgery or something related with nervous system if you had another chance. Yeah. Probably beyond yeah. from now on. Yeah. If you uh, would have a chance to go back at uh, you know the time when you started your career, and if let's say your wife agreed to do whatever you would like to do, would you do anything differently? You, you don't know my wife. She will not agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yes, because I I think that. Uh, the nervous system is so, so beautiful, not only brain, but, uh, you know, on the study, on, 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 on the study about uh, the, the medical study, uh, for the function, even the function of the taking something with your hand, uh, there is not sufficient uh, teaching between the sensory and sensitive systems and the motor system. In between the two, we learn very well one, we learn very well the other one, but how it works together. It is a little bit uh, like that. And it is so important. For example, when you are standing here, the proprioception, which pathway how it works there, how it is related with the function of the other side. And it is for the club feet, it is for everything. I heard a lot of, of, uh, of uh, studies this morning about uh, the uh, gait analysis. We measure function, we measure, but this gait analysis, it's uh, in reality that you measure, it's uh, only the result, but how it works for that. This is a reason. Difference between the result and the reason. And this is so important. How long, uh, when uh, you have a sensation on the foot, it remains, it goes there. How long it takes in some CP patient? How long it takes in myeloma and No. Nothing there. But uh, uh, in a uh, so all this basic function is, is so important. And it is a, a little bit uh, not sufficiently studied in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in pediatric orthopedics. In, it is my opinion. Basic neurology. It is not so for the neurologist. The neurologist just make a diagnosis. But the neurologist make the diagnosis. But for the treatment of the patient, uh, not uh, so useful, the treatment of the pediatric uh, orthopedic patient. Thank you. Uh, follow, as a follow-up question, I want to go on a little bit more private life issues. Uh, one thing that has not changed for sure 
from the time that you started your career and today is that one day is composed of 24 hours. So for time management purposes, how would you manage your one day when you were in the beginning or in the mid of career? Let's say, for example, how many hours would you sleep or uh, would, is, how many hours would you work a day? Oh, this is a very variable because, you know, oh, very variable because when you wake up during the midnight and you repeat your surgery, I have not a chronometer to measure how long I stay for that. So I, I, I don't know. I don't need a, a lot of, uh, of sleep. Generally, four or five hours is sufficient for me. But uh, my wife a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, no. Uh, uh, something important is to to have a, 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 a hobby. To have a hobby, mm -hmm. to have a hobby, mm -hmm. to do something when you're in vacation, mm -hmm. during uh, during the, the, the vacation. My hobby is to do stained glasses. Uh -huh. Of course, uh, especially when I have uh, no more surgery to do, mm -hmm. uh, working something with the hand is good. Mm -hmm. So I do stained glasses. Very good. Uh, maybe one final question before we close up. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's not exactly a question. I want to thank Jean. Because uh, 40 years ago, I was a young resident. <laughs> Olivier, yeah, I know him. <laughs> yeah, Olivier Vajon, a, a French uh, young surgeon. Uh, yes, 40 years ago, uh, in 1975, I was uh, just a, a young resident and I. Uh, um, no, it, in 77, excuse me, after my military service. And uh, I was in a general uh, surgery uh, department, and I did visit Jean uh, each Tuesday morning uh, to his consultation. And uh, if you want to uh, choose a mentor, I think you can choose a mentor for the power, for your career, but you can choose your mentor, I, I think it's a bad choice for love and for experience. And I think it's very important to see uh, meeting, it's, it's important uh, in a scientific meeting, but if you want to learn, you have to see, to observe your mentor. To observe, and John, I remember the question and the examination of the patient and so on. You have really, I think it's by the way, and uh, thank you. Because uh, after I did practice uh, spine surgery, but spine treatment, and I agree about all what you said. And thanks, thanks, many thanks to John de Pousset. Thanks, Olivier. Thanks, thanks, Olivier. So, Uh, we've learned a lot today and I really thank you for um, no coming problem. here and uh, it was really great. I think strategy is what we need to focus strategy. on and research as well is research. what we have to do. Strategy, exactly. research. Yeah. Well, thank Everything you very much for coming here and sharing this with us. Everything. Everybody.